Okay, Ben Bradley, uh, when did you realize you were going to be a philosopher? Well, uh, so I guess like most people, I had no idea what philosophy was until I got to college. Uh, and uh, yeah, I took a logic class as a freshman, and I just did well in it, and thought, you know, I had no other direction, really. I was a music student at the time, but I didn't want to be a musician, or I didn't have any plan to become a musician. So uh, uh, so I thought, hey, this, this seems good, and I just... Uh, Took a bunch more classes and uh, enjoyed them, and thought this I could do this for a long time. So, <laughs> uh, so that's kind of the boring Not story. Not really a ringing I endorsement there. But the, uh, I guess the thinking about what got me interested in it was uh, so you know I enjoyed the logic was just like puzzle solving and really easy and, and fun. But uh, I enjoyed reading like Air, uh, Mill, uh, Plato. You know, I just I. I just really enjoyed reading these people and uh, and thinking about these kind of things for the first time and uh, and really got hooked on it, I guess. So what was your instrument before you <laughs> gave it up? Uh, the cello. Cello, oh. Yeah. That's, uh, that's actually uh, a useful instrument. My my son did uh, bassoon. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Well, Not it's quite. probably easier to make your, to, less competition that's in true. bassoon. That's true. That's certainly <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of an interesting selection of names. Uh, Aya, uh, I think, uh, was it uh, that you, because the thing about language, truth, and logic is that it's sort of a, a blast furnace, you know, it's oh, like, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get rid of everything. It's, it's sort of a human, uh, you oh, know, sure. uh, burn everything kind of approach. Was that what appealed to you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as a 19-year-old, I was pretty into that sort of burn everything uh, <laughs> idea. Uh, and I was also coming off of, as a kid, I was religious. Uh, or at least I went to church every week, you know, and I, as, as I became like 16, 17, I started to have doubts and, you know, and a lot of things about the church bothered me. What denomination? Was, Presbyterian. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't horrible, but it was just, uh, you know, the, the hypocrisy and also just kind of not seeing the, uh, how any, why I should think any of these things were true were issues for me. And then so reading error and just saying, oh, this, that's because this is all meaningless. <laughs> I, thought, oh, that, I knew that was something. <laughs> that must be it. I'm not sure he was right about that, but at the time that was uh, an appeal for me there, Yeah. Yeah, and of course he uh, he went on to get in a fight with Mike Tyson at a party. So right, right. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm going to read a quote from uh, the introduction of this book of yours. Incidentally, I love the uh, the death of the panda on the cover. That's a great picture. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, ask you to expound upon it. So here's okay. the quote. I think simplicity is a very desirable feature of a theory. My aim is to take a handful of core insights and to formulate views that most accurately capture the ideas behind those insights, while completely eschewing any accretions or modifications that would give the appearance of ad hocery in order to satisfy intuitions about particular cases. And you go on to say, complicated views always go wrong somewhere. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so first of all, why is simplicity so important? And secondly, maybe you can talk about the handful of core insights that you particularly value. Sure. Uh, well, you know, it's hard to say why simplicity is important, I guess, other than... It shines uh, forth like a diamond? It does, it does. <laughs> um, it has more to do with... Uh, uh, so... So you take a simple theory, and you, see, you think it has a problem with this one case. And then you say, well, let's just change the theory and, and make it a little more complicated and carve out an exception for this case. And there's always an unintended consequence of doing that. And it's just a matter of finding out what it is. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's sort of the general attitude that I have. And so, um, you know... Uh, so, so some of what we have to do is is explain is showing what goes wrong when you carve out these exceptions, right? Um, but I think it's also important just to forcefully state the case for the simple view, 
And, you know, part of it is also when you have a simple view, if, if the core insight is right and you start carving out exceptions, then you're uh, in a way saying that the core insight is, is not really right, right? Um, you're saying, well, if this, was so, if this was such a good idea, then how come it goes wrong in these cases? And so, so uh, just speaking very abstractly here, right, uh, the thought is just, well, let's suppose it doesn't go wrong and let's just see what the big picture is when we, when we develop these thoughts. So you're a big bullet biter. I am a little bit. I'm a little, <laughs> I mean, it's obviously it's not. Uh, you don't want to bite too many bullets, but uh, but I'm willing to do it. When uh, uh, I, I prefer to do that than carve out, you, you know, make the Except. theory complicated. Yeah. Okay. So, what are the core insights that are your credo? Um, yeah. Well. Uh, so in well, the book. I, I, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I could uh, I could give you another quote uh, to help sure. you out here. From sure. uh, the, the first one was from page uh, 20 Roman numerals. This one's from page 16. So there's the deprivation account of the right. evil of death. There's hedonism, of course, which, uh, right. of course, is uh, go, you go into in more detail in, in this nice little book. Right. Uh, then there's sort of more um, kind of uh, down in the nitty gritty views, like the idea that there's a zero well being level for dead people. Right. Uh, and uh, also the view uh, that is labeled now subsequentism, that uh, death is bad for its victim after their debt. Okay, right. so um, let's start with the deprivation account. Obviously, I, I think um, you start with hedonism in this book and you've got this whole book on it, but I, I think it, it's, uh, it's nice to start by talking about the deprivation account just because I think that's something that everybody can get uh, right. the the significance of kind of immediately. Sure. Yeah. So that's really the core view that I'm defending in that book is the deprivation de deprivation account of the badness of death. And so the the simple statement of the view is just how bad death is for you when it's bad um, is determined by how much of a good life uh, uh, the death deprives you of. Right. Um, or, you know, death could be good for you if death deprives you of a, a bad existence. Uh, but, but the core idea is just, you know, to, to figure out the value of death for you or the, the disvalue, you look at how well things would have gone for you had you not died. That's the, the basic deprivationist idea. Okay, and let me, um, let me give the background or the, the, the enemy uh, against whom the deprivation account was developed and it is of course Epicurus. So sure. Epicurus uh, famously for philosophers and perhaps a lot of non-philosophers too argues that death isn't bad for the one who dies um, and the basic argument is my death won't be bad for me because I won't be around. Right. right. Um, right. So uh, and that I think a lot of people find intuitive that um, you know, why should I care? I won't be there. And, and of course, the background is he, uh, he's a hedonist, but I don't think the argument really depends on that. Although, and of course, you, you, you defend hedonism, so clearly you don't think it leads to Epicurus's view. Right. Um, but uh, the essential idea is, look, suffering I have to experience. And harm is suffering. And I can't experience it if I don't exist. So, you know, chill. Don't, don't worry about death. And, and of course, his follower Lucretius later says, look, we don't care about the time before we existed. We don't lie awake at night thinking I wasn't around, you know, to, to see World War I or something. Uh, man, you know, that's terrible. My non-existence eats away at me. My, my pre-birth uh, non-existence eats away at me. And Lucretius says, well, that doesn't bother us. So we should have the same view about our post-death non-existence. It just should be nothing to us. Right. Now, the deprivation account, um, how does that respond to that? Yeah, good. So, uh, so first I should say, I mean, there's, there's a way in which Epicurus is right, right? And that is uh, when you're dead, on, on, the, on, on my view and, and most uh, and materialist views, right? Um, you don't exist anymore. Uh, and certainly you don't exist in a way you, you might, exist, say, as you, corpse, as you might exist as a corpse. You might exist as a corpse, but that's not a way in which, uh, you know, even if you continue to exist as a corpse, nothing bad is going to be happening to you at that time. And uh, and that actually 
uh, it's, it might seem uncontroversial, but it's but it's not uncontroversial because on some views, you know, there can still be bad things that happen to you after you die. So on um, desire fulfillment views, for example, it could turn on, on at least certain views, it can turn out that uh, bad things can be happening to you because all the things that you wanted to happen while you were alive are being frustrated after you die, right? Um, you might think things are um, continuing to go badly for you even while you're dead, um, and uh, on some views that turns out to be true, and, and I agree with Epicurus that, that uh, those views are false. Um, that once you either go out of existence or become a corpse, nothing intrinsically bad is happening to you anymore, right? Nothing bad in itself is happening to you anymore. So the deprivation view says uh, that doesn't mean that death isn't bad at all. The way that death is bad is it's bad extrinsically or instrumentally. It's bad because it prevents good things from happening to you, right? So. Um, uh, so it's it, death is bad for you in the same way that you know if you if you were put into a dreamless sleep that was permanent, right? You might think that was bad for you because look at all the stuff, uh, look at all the stuff you'd be missing out on uh, if you were put into a permanent dreamless sleep. Um, and death is bad for you in that same kind of way, right? It's not you're not in pain while you're in this permanent dreamless sleep, right? Uh, but I know a lot of insomniacs who <laughs> yeah. probably would uh, think that sounds pretty good. Right, right. right. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the deprivation response: is to say, you know, you know, think of these cases as analogous, being dead and being in a in a permanent dreamless sleep. You know, the the way in which death is bad is the, is the same kind of way as it would be bad to go into that kind of sleep. Yeah. So um, what's interesting is uh, you're arguing on the one hand against Epicurus, because Epicurus says your death doesn't harm you, and you say, oh, contraire, it does harm you. Uh, just extrinsically, but right. of course there are, you're also arguing with other deprivation account theorists, uh, and a couple of well-known ones are Thomas Nagel uh, and uh, Fred Feldman. And so, for example, Thomas Nagel says that there are bad things that can happen to you that don't involve suffering. That include, you know, something like the Truman Show experience, right? Uh, apparently, it's the twentieth anniversary of that movie, which makes me feel very Oh, um, <laughs> right. but of course, in that movie, he thinks his wife loves him when, in fact, she loathes him, and she's an actor played, uh, paid to play the part, and so on. And of right. course, uh, and supposing he dies without ever finding out, he has still, uh, he has still been harmed by this. So you can be harmed without knowing it, is what he argues for. Right. Would you uh, agree with that view? Well, yeah. So I, I don't. I, I do agree that you can be harmed without knowing it. And, Just and, not in the that, way that he's saying. Yeah, not in the way that Nagel thinks. So I don't think that something intrinsically bad can be happening to you without you being aware of it. Because I think the only intrinsically bad things that happen to you are pains, right? So unless you can be in pain without being aware of it, which is controversial. <laughs> and pain uh, wouldn't be bad you, anymore then. Yeah, right. You wouldn't wonder if it, if it would be bad then. Uh, so I think that nothing can be bad in itself for you without you being aware of it, but uh, uh, but something could be extrinsically bad for you without you being aware of it, and death is like that. Uh, I mean, if death comes suddenly, if, you're, if you die in your sleep, you may never see it coming, you may never know, know that you were going to die, or, uh, uh, but it would still be depriving you of all these good things, and so it would be uh, it would be bad for you, uh, regardless. So I think Nagel and other people follow him in this mistake um, uh, uh, may have just been uh, uh, misunderstanding what he needed to do to respond to Epicurus, right? So. Uh, one way you might respond to Epicurus would be to say, there, to try to find some way in which something bad in itself is happening to you, even though you you don't exist or aren't aware of it at the time, right? Um, so he does this, and John Fisher has a similar sort of strategy, I think, um, trying to show that some sort of experience, that, that the experience requirement uh, is false, that, that you don't, that things can be going bad for you independently of your experiences. Right, and they take themselves to be arguing. They take that to be required to undermine Epicurus. And I just think that's a mistake. I don't think you have to reject uh, hedonism uh, in order to uh, respond to Epicurus. So I think that's uh, you know it, it's these these examples like like Nagel's examples. Um, 
uh, that allegedly involve harms to people who aren't aware of it. They're, they're interesting examples, and they might be counterexamples to hedonism as a theory about well-being. And, you know, they're worth thinking about on those terms, uh, but they're not so important in determining what makes death bad for you, I don't think. Yeah, so you want to say um, the wrong approach is to say that death is intrinsically bad because of some non-hedonistic kind of harm. The right approach is to say that it's extrinsically bad, that you're missing out on good stuff. So it's not that you're getting bad stuff without knowing it, it's that right. you're not getting good stuff without knowing exactly. it. Right. Now, of course, uh, the major Epicurean response to this is to say, sure, I get why, you know, if, uh, like your example of the baseball tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, give the example of the baseball tickets. Yeah, so the example is just, uh, uh, I, I give my friend some, some baseball tickets, I put them in his mailbox, somebody else comes and takes them, my friend never found out about the tickets, um, so in, instead of enjoying the baseball game the next day, uh, my friend is at home uh, being bored, right? <laughs> Not doing anything interesting. Rather than being at the baseball game. Rather than bored. being at the baseball game. They never know it, right? <laughs> well, my friend, the friend likes baseball. Okay. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, 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 consider the the act of taking away the tickets, right? Uh, this is an act that makes my friend worse off. Uh, I would want to say if there's such a thing as harm, that it harms them, right? It harms my friend. Um, but my friend never finds out about it, never aware that there, that this deprivation occurred. Um, I think that does nothing to show that harm didn't take place. Okay. So, um... What, what's important in that example is that it can, you can have harm without ever finding out about it. Because um, what, one way I think, uh, because uh, Nagel's example of, you know, people slandering you behind your back, you know, people, your loved one being unfaithful, that kind of thing harms you. And I think what an Epicurean can say is, insofar as that's intuitively appealing, and insofar as that makes sense to us, it's because we always envisage the person finding out about it, right? Yeah, that later on, that. That, that, you know, they are harmed when they're revealed, which indeed is why, you know, in introductory classes, when people talk about utilitarianism, they say lying to your gran on her deathbed is okay, because right. it would be cruel to her to reveal, I, I never, I threw away all your sweaters or whatever, you know, yeah. when, after you gave them to me, and I always hated your cat. You know, they would just be bad, and it's, it's better that they never know. Right. So um, now what you're arguing is that no, uh, your friend is harmed even if they never find out because there's right. this better life that they could have had. Exactly. Now, but again, Epicurus uh, is, is going to say or an Epicurean can say, okay, even if I agree with that, there's something different about death because, of course, I can always point to the person sitting at home bored and say, there they are existing in a suboptimal state. Whereas when someone's dead, it's like, I'm not going to feel sorry for them because they're not missing out because they don't exist. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so if it's, uh, so, so one thing you can say is, um, you know, the, is, then it turns out to make a big difference whether the person continues to exist as a corpse, right? Because if we've got their corpse here, we can say that's the person who's being deprived by right. uh, by being dead, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So we can still point to them. Um, and that doesn't seem like it should be important, right? Intuitively, it seems like whether they were cremated or not uh, has no bearing on whether their death, their death previously uh, was bad for them, right? Uh, uh, and similarly, you can say, you know, existence, uh, you know, even if they weren't a corpse, if they go back to the dreamless sleep example, like, so, so suppose we've got this person in a permanent dreamless sleep, um, you know, th they can, they're existing and, and they're even alive, right? So you don't even have to say, suppose, suppose you weren't happy saying that a person continues to exist after they die as a corpse, right? Um, well, we have this living person who's in a permanent dreamless sleep. Right, um, they still exist, right? Uh, but putting them into that state was still bad for them, and I want to say in just the same way that killing them would have been, right? Uh, uh, and 
And so the fact that the person doesn't exist doesn't seem like it's the sort of thing, it, you know, it's not going to distinguish, it, it would distinguish uh, between these cases in a way that seems irrelevant, right, to, to me. Right? Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, so um, I think the dreamless sleep e example, you'd want to know, well, do you destroy their capacities to mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, so in other words, do you take their brain and they take their cortex and put it in a blender, but their brainstem uh, continues to keep their body alive? Or are they just, you know, like uh, Snow White after, or every Disney princess at some point in their story, you know, placed into yeah. a slumber that could last forever? Right. So, so you might, you might think it makes a difference whether they, um, they you could poke them and wake them up. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, that you might think they're, they're not in as bad a shape. As somebody who uh, <laughs> doesn't exist, who does, doesn't exist, right? Right? right. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, I think I want to resist that. So, so if we're saying that you know, if if the person's put into the, this dreamless sleep, and it's determined that they cannot wake up, right? So you know, we've been, we've encased them in something that uh, uh, keeps them alive but prevents anybody from waking them up. Um, um, I think there's just nothing good happening for them, and they're they might as well be dead in that case. Uh, uh, and you it might be that we're thinking you'd, you'd still rather be in that situation than be dead because you think well maybe there's a chance. Right? <laughs> they so you're might saying there's a chance. Another they might Jim like Carrey movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be much less controversial. For example, we'll get later to your argument about how uh, dead people have a well-being level of zero rather than no well-being level at all. I think yeah. a lot more people would be willing to say that the person in the dreamless sleep has a well-being level of zero sure. than the dead person. Right, right. Uh, so it seems like there there is an intuitive difference, even if you, you want to make the case that uh, there isn't a real difference, or that the Epicurean certainly shouldn't see a difference. Yeah, the Epicurean's going to have a hard time seeing a difference there, I think, um, given that, you know, uh, uh, any hedonist is going to have a hard time seeing a difference between not existing and existing but having no sensations, right? I mean, I think, insofar as I can channel Epicurus, I'm going to, I'm going to think Epicurus is going to, that deny that that's a valuable existence. Yeah. <laughs> right, and uh, I mean, I, I'm i drawn to the Epicurean view and I, I, I share, uh, I, I share the, the problems. I, I think that Epicurus has a bunch of very good questions for the deprivation account that sure. you, you respond to and that Feldman, of course, responds to too because he's got a deprivation account. Um, but of course, the main downside to the Epicurean view is I, I always think, you know, uh, in the, the Shining, when yeah. um, Jack Nicholson is coming up the stairs towards Shelley Duvall holding the baseball bat and he says, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just <laughs> going to beat your brains in or something. Well, yeah. Epicurus says uh, something like, I'm not going to harm you. I'm just going to kill you. Right. Right. Which, which right. <laughs> does seem wrong. Right. Um, but... Uh, of course, I think that the the best puzzle for the Epicurean is uh, that you spend a lot of time discussing is uh, when the Epicurean asks, okay, suppose death harms me, when? The timing problem. When right. am I harmed by death? And of course, Epi uh, Epicurus can say, is it before I die? I'm not dead. I shouldn't care. Uh, is it after I die? I don't exist. I shouldn't care. So right. either way, I shouldn't care. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I think this is a great problem too. And uh, uh, the, so the, 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 the response that I favor is uh, the zero well-being uh, response that you mentioned earlier. So, so what I want to say is... So, so what the way I interpret Epicurus's challenge is to, or the, or the, the question, is uh, at what time am I worse off for being dead than I would have been had I not been dead, right? Uh, I think that's the that's the way of, of stating the question that makes it clear 
you know what you have to what what an answer involves, right? Um, so some people have said, well, this is what's led some people to say, well, actually, it does harm you before you die, right? Um, it uh, it harmed you at the times that you had various projects or were um, interested in various things, right? And that your death will later deprive you of, right? So your death kind of retroactively harms you at those previous times when you had these desires or plans or projects that end up getting frustrated by your death. Um, and as a hedonist, I can't be happy with that response. I also don't find it very intuitive to say that somebody was retroactively harmed in that yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, like you, you see the giant boulder about to squish you and you think, man, I'm suffering back there in the past <laughs> right now. Right, right, uh, right. I feel sorry for that guy because he's about to lose out when right. I get squished right now. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that that seems wrong. Uh, so what I want to say, uh, I, I want to say the mo what I take to be the most straightforward thing about the case, which is, yes, at these later times after you die, you are worse off than you would have been uh, had you been alive. Right, and in particular, at the times that you would have been enjoying yourself, right, at the at the times that you would have been having a good life, those are the times that you're worse off for having died. Uh, yeah, and I do know people who get sad on the birthdays of their deceased loved ones, yeah. and by your view, that kind of makes sense because they would have been having a good birthday and getting presents. Right, right. This is a particularly yeah. bad time for my gran who died two years ago. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it's now, yeah, it, it's not, it's not like they're suffering now, but yeah, they're, they're, this is a time when their death really makes a difference to how, <laughs> to how things went for them, right? It, it makes a difference at the times that they would have been enjoying themselves at their grandkids' graduations or whatever, you know, those are the times when they really are worse, worse off. So, but obviously the, the, the thing that a lot of people are unhappy with, with this response is that means, you know, in order for you to be worse off at a time after you have died, you have to have a well-being level at that time, right? Um, there has to be some comparison that we're making between, you know, how well off you would have been at that time and how well off you actually are at that time while you're dead and let's say don't exist, right? Um, so what I want to say is that you continue to have a well-being level of zero at times when you don't exist, right? Uh, and so this is the thing that people find weird. So it violates what people have called the no, no well-being without being thesis, right? <laughs> uh, you can't have a well-being if you don't have being. Uh, but what I want to say is that there is somebody, we can still identify an individual who has that well-being level at that time, it's just not somebody who exists at that time, right? It's the person who existed in the past. So arguably this might commit me to eternalism, which is the view that uh, non-present things exist, right? So, so right now, uh, uh, right now, Socrates doesn't exist, right? But timelessly, Socrates exists because Socrates exists at this time in the past, right? And so, <clears throat> about a dead person, what we say is, you know, even though this person doesn't exist now, they do exist in this timeless sense, right? And by existing in this timeless sense, we can attribute things to them at this time, right? We can say of them, that, they're, that they have a zero well-being level at this time. That's the basic idea. Right, uh, uh, which is an illustration of how one can be led to metaphysical views uh, about all kinds of things by yeah. starting with a problem somewhere else in philosophy. Like sure. suddenly yeah. we're talking about, you know, the ontology of time right. and, you know, presentism versus eternalism. Right. So, uh, like, yes, as you say, uh, eternalism is the view that, you know, uh, uh, time is like space. Just right. because things are over there and I can't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And just because the dinosaurs are back in a few million years ago doesn't mean they don't exist. Right. Um, and, and this starts from worrying about a puzzle about death. Uh, right. Which is, which is in, interesting in itself. Now, um, uh, yes, let's say a little bit about some of the um, implications of your view. So, for example, as you say, 
the implications of your version of the deprivation are account two. You highlight two uh, controversial effects. Um, one of which, or, well, one of them perhaps isn't isn't as controversial, except in some of its implications, and that is that the earlier death, uh, the earlier a death is, the worse it is, because of course you're deprived of more. Now the right. controversial implication is that uh, a a sp spontaneously aborting fetus um, is worse off than uh, you know a teenager who dies tragically in a car crash uh, because the teenager at least got to live some of the life whereas and therefore is deprived of less right, right. Um, and that strikes some people as unacceptable right, right. Uh, yeah so let's talk about that one first and then we yeah, can, uh, then we'll talk about the second one which is that the badness of death is independent of the life lived Right, sure. So, so yeah. So, so the very early deaths are uh, are controversial, right? What what should we say about very early deaths? Deaths of embryos or fetuses. You know, are those the worst deaths? Are those the most harmful deaths? And the deprivation account entails that they are, as long as it's the same individual, as long as the the embryo is deprived of is the, the individual being deprived of this future, right? right? So if an individual doesn't come into existence until later on, uh, you know, at post-embryo state, then an embryo isn't deprived of anything. It's, it's, it's whatever this future individual would be getting, it's not something that the embryo would be getting, right? So, but let's, it, let's just say that it's the same individual, right? Um, then, yeah, you have to say it's, that's the, the, if you're a deprivation theorist, that it's very, very bad for an embryo to die, right? Now, so first, first thing to say is, let's try to mitigate that a little bit by talking about Ooh, don't various, get, it's various don't get intuitions. Don't in, into ad hocery. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 let's not get into, before, I will talk about some ad hocery in a minute, <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, but let's try to mitigate it. So the first thought is, well, uh, uh, you could say that death is very bad for an embryo, but still think that it doesn't matter that much, right? So all you have to do is deny that all harms of an equal magnitude are equally important, morally speaking, right? And one reason that you might think that a great harm to an embryo is not that important is because an embryo is not a person, right? So if an embryo is not a person, then you might think even if it's greatly harmed uh, by being prevented from coming into existence and becoming a person, um, that harm to that embryo is not very important, right? You might think it doesn't have rights. Uh -huh. right? You might think you don't have rights until you're a sufficiently sophisticated uh, individual, and so uh, so uh, harming you isn't going to violate any of your rights. And so this is why you might think um, even if you buy, even if you are a deprivation theorist and you're committed to saying that uh, death is very bad for embryos, that nevertheless. Uh, abortion may be morally permissible. Nevertheless, we shouldn't devote great resources to to preventing abortions, right? Um, you know, the, the so that's that's one kind of strategy, which I think but is a plausible strategy. Go ahead. Notice, uh, so the Epicurean is going to say, "Wait a minute, people get mad at me for saying that death is not a harm, but now you're saying it is a harm. It's just not a harm that matters." And it's like, uh, why is that view better than my view? Well, it does. I mean, in most cases, it matters. In, if uh, the death of a of an adult human uh, harms them, then that harm does matter, right? So it's only so so. Uh, but isn't that a kind of chauvinism now? Then, if because it's exactly the same kind of harm, and we're right. going to say it matters because we like you more, right? <laughs> or because uh, you're. But even though it's exactly the same, it's the same experience of the same kind of being. Yep. Um, it's just that, oh, we decided your harm doesn't matter because uh, we, we labeled you a non-person. Well, in some ways, same, the same kind of being, but in some ways, not the same kind of being, right? Because it's not a person, right? So right, it's but not... the, harm, the, the, the deprived is experiences of a person. So that oh, non-person yeah, yeah, yeah. right. is deprived of person experiences. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, so being de so on this way of going, you have to say that being deprived of, of valuable person experiences uh, 
doesn't necessarily matter uh, unless the, the being that's being deprived of them has achieved personhood already, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you might think, uh, so yeah, uh, you, you'd have to deny on this, on this route that, uh, that what you're deprived of uh, always matters the same amount, right? And that, that's true. I mean, yeah, you have to accept that. Um, uh, I, I, I guess one wants to know how you get around that problem, right? I mean, everybody's got issues in this area when some when uh, individuals come into existence, right? Um, you're going to have to say something different about an individual at this stage and at this stage, um, almost no matter what view you have, right? Yeah, and here's the way I understand the deprivation account, uh, mainly from reading uh, originally, because the first time I came across it was reading Fred Feldman's book, Confrontations with the Reaper, which is another very nice introduction. I mean, your, your book is a very nice introduction, um, uh, and that one is too. Um, and uh, the way I get, I understand it is, as he says, because one of the Epicurean puzzles that both of you uh, appear to have uh, come up with a, a plausible response to is um, the Epicurean says, how can you say uh, it's worse because you're, you're comparing the experiences of a live person and the experiences of a dead person and saying that one is worse and, and one of them doesn't exist. And uh, the way Feldman put it is, is, no, it's not a life to death comparison, it's a life to life comparison. And right. you're comparing short life because dies here to long life because uh, with the doesn't lie. And clearly this one's better. And in fact, we can see that this is the amount you're deprived of. So in fact, this life, uh, uh, this life is bad precisely to this extent, because right. this right. is what you missed out on. Now, right. What non-philosophy students are going to say is, but wait a minute, this never happened. This is fantasy. Okay, okay. so y you can make any shit up you want. I mean, uh, so why, why are you allowed to do that, you philosophers? Yeah. At which point we start talking about possible worlds. Right. Right. right? And, and what we say is, well, there's the nearest possible world uh, at which this doesn't happen. And on that possible world, uh, I, you know, I live this long. But once you start doing that, you can start doing about, well, there's a very near possible world in which, um, you know, uh, this different sperm meets this egg and there's a whole different person. And that whole different person has a good life that they don't have ever on our, our world. And if we can say that uh, a, a being on our world suffers because they don't have this, why can't we say that somebody who never comes into existence on our world, the, the sperm and egg pairing that never happens, that does happen on this near possible world, why can't we say that, they're, that that is a person with, an, uh, with a, a you know, well-being level of zero, and there's all these people that never came into existence that are harmed on our actual Earth? Yeah, so... so uh... So I think this is a great question, and uh, there are different things that you can say, and I'm not sure what the best thing is to say, but one thought is just to say something just like what I just said, which is to say, yeah, um, as a matter of fact, so, so, so we'll call this the, the really extreme view, and I, I defend this view very briefly in, a, in another paper, but so, so not only do the dead have level, well-being levels of zero, but um, all these merely possible people who never actually exist, have actual well-being levels of zero, right? Let's give zeros to everybody. <laughs> That's the extreme view. It's like the end uh, term you, exam. Yes, zeros all around. Uh, so, uh, so, on this, so on this way of thinking about things, you'd say, yeah, um, this merely possible person who didn't get brought into existence has that actual well-being level of zero and would have had this great well-being had they been brought into existence, and so they're much worse off. So it's bad for them that they didn't get brought into existence. But since they don't exist, they don't have any rights. <laughs> they're not actually people. So you treat them just like you treat the embryo, right? Um, that's that's one way of going. It's just to say, yeah, there are all the, there are all these harms, and uh, and thankfully, 99% um, uh, of them we can ignore because they're all happening to individuals that don't have any any rights, any personhood, any moral status at all, right? Because they don't don't actually exist.
That's that's that the that's an extreme way of going. Right. <laughs> that, uh, that's biting a large bullet. Um, <laughs> the. Uh, this, this strikes me, I, I shouldn't say the word ironic because I know it's being misused, but in the way that uh, uh, it's understood these days, uh, it is a little ironic that uh, you end up defending, for example, hedonism and, and as Epicurus and modern Epicureans like the utilitarians do, yeah. And then you're drawn to this view finally, well, but morality has to be about rights so that we can uh -huh. discount so that we can discount uh, harms and say that some harms and, and, you know, harm and wrong, not the same thing. You know, something can be morally wrong uh, and involve harm and something uh, can be morally wrong without involving harm and something can involve harm and not be morally wrong. So it's like, Whereas it do, doesn't it seem like one of the appeals of uh, you know hedonism and things like that is we can that'll tell us things about what is right and wrong, whereas now you're saying uh, okay this being gets deprived of, of this kind of life and it's not wrong or it's not something we should care about and then this being gets deprived of exactly the same thing and suddenly it's important. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, so this is one way in which uh, this is an area where I have to struggle to kind of keep apart what I actually think and what I need to argue for the sake of of, of making this point. And right. so, you know, I am I am skeptical about rights, um, but I do think that um, even if we don't think that there are any rights, really, if we if, if, suppose suppose we we want to go uh, the utilitarian say there aren't any rights. Um, you still might want to say that there is such a thing as moral status, right? There are individuals that there are individuals that we have to care about and they're the ones that uh, that can enjoy themselves, right? And there are under other individuals that can't enjoy themselves or experience pain, they're not sentient, and so we don't have to worry about them. And maybe they have a kind of well being but it's but not going to be a kind of like the well-being of a computer or a car or something. Uh -huh. They can't enjoy themselves. So, so you still have to make some kind of distinction in this neighborhood between the individuals that, that, that matter and the individuals that don't, even if you're a full-blown hedonistic utilitarian, right? You know who can't enjoy themselves? Who's Dead that? people. That is true. That is true. <laughs> yes, right, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you do, if you, uh, so your argument that abortion, uh, abortion causes, the, causes more harm than killing a teenager. That's your, that's the view that the deprivation account that you defend is committed to, but yeah. you want to argue that it's not necessarily therefore wrong. And in fact, you, you would very much not want to say that abortion is more wrong than killing a teenager. Right. And Although I do have, I, yeah, I should say that. I, I, so lately, I've been trying to work on a, a, a different kind of view, right? Okay. So, I'll, which I'll just throw it out there for you and see cool. if you like that even more, even better. Breaking news. Uh, yeah. So, so it's not a, a, a completely original, but um, but the thought is. Uh, so here's a general thought that motivates this way of thinking, right? So, what is it about embryos that might make us think that? that they're not harmed by being killed. And one thought is, uh, we're not really sure whether they're really subjects of harm yet. We're not really sure whether they're the sort of thing that can be harmed or benefited in the same way that an adult person can be harmed or benefited. And there are other, other cases where we have a similar sort of ambivalence or, uh, you know, a, we're, we're, not, where we're not sure what to say, like, like my plant, I've got a plant over here, right? So would my plant be harmed by being, it, you know, if I, if I ripped it up out of the roots and threw it out the window? Well, you might think, yeah, kind of. I mean, in the way that plants can be harmed, it, it would be harmed, you know, it would die if you did that. Um, but, uh, but would it really be harmed in the same way that a, that a person is harmed? You might not be so sure, or think about like an ecosystem. Can an ecosystem really be harmed? Or you know, my computer. If I pour water on my computer, you might say that I harmed the computer. But is that really harm? So there, I think there are a lot of these borderline cases where we think <clears throat> I'm not really sure what to say about whether this individual was harmed 
uh, at least in a way that matters morally, right? Uh, was there was there moral harm done here, especially with a computer? You think, no, harming the computer harms me because I want to use the computer, right? But it doesn't. The computer itself is not really the, the sort of thing that can be harmed. So, yeah. so, so the thought is. Uh, there's something that maybe comes in degrees here, or at least there's some vagueness. And the thing that that, that is subject to this vagueness is being a subject of well-being, right? Being a subject of benefit or harm. There's a scale, right? Uh, where a, a, you know you've got adult humans over here who clearly can be subjects of harm, who clearly have well-being, and then over here you've got. Uh, computers that, that that it seems pretty clearly can't in their in their current state, right? Or let's say uh, uh, simple plants, right? They, you might think that, that those definitely can't be. And then maybe over here you got worms, and you know, and so on until. And the, but there's going to be a spectrum. Right? So the thought is that M, as human beings develop, they develop from something that is definitely not a subject of well-being into something that definitely is a subject of well-being and it's a gradual development right so there are different things that you might want to say here uh, and people have said similar things about personhood right people somehow gradually develop into being a person i don't want to talk about personhood because i think that's a, a it's a loaded term, and I think it's talking about subjects of well-being is really the thing that, that's important when we're thinking about harm, right? Because non-persons can be harmed, I think. Right? Um, so one thought is you might try to develop a view according to which the extent to which you're harmed is determined not just by what you're deprived of, but also by the extent to which you are, at the time, a subject of harm. Or subject of well-being, and so the thought would be, uh, when you're figuring out how much an embryo is harmed, one factor is how much are they deprived of, which is a lot, right? And another factor is to what extent are they a subject of well-being, which you might think is a very small degree. And so you might, so one way to go would be you multiply these things. You know, this maybe this we have this individual that's a, a well-being subject to degree 0.01. And so you multiply the extent of the well-being by uh, uh, the extent of the deprivation by the degree to which it's a well-being subject, and so then you get a, a lower harm, a lower amount of harm that's suffered by the individual. Right. Okay, but then again, my my point is that dead people have no capability of suffering. So you were uh, right. either that would destroy your deprivation account because you would say, okay that they're, they're being harmed, but because they are totally incapable of feeling harm at this point, you know, it's discounted to zero. Or you would have to say, no, the relevant individual is the, the individual that survives on this other possible world, and because that being has uh, the ca capacity of uh, feeling harm, then, the, then we can use, you know, the adult human being uh, factor to multiply. Yeah, so actually my thought is that you look at the past person, right? So this individual dies, um, to what extent is their death a harm? Well, the thought is you look at to what extent were they a well-being subject, right? Okay. If they were a full well, if they were a full well-being subject, then you don't discount the, the badness of their death at all, right? But if they never were, then they, if, or if they only ever reached a, a minimal degree of, of being a well-being subject, then they might, then their death would get discounted. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I'm just kind of exploring that. I don't yeah, know how I no. feel about it yet, but that's I, 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 I feel like that's, that's a way of that's a way that's at least motivated by a core insight about this vagueness of attributing well-being subjecthood to individuals. Right. Um, of course, uh, you know. I can imagine there's some anti-abortion activists who are saying, why are you trying so hard? Right, right, you know, just right. accept that abortion <laughs> is horrific. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but, uh, Good, I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> yeah now, um, uh, Jeff McMahon thinks he's got a different way of uh, explaining why the teenager's death is uh, bad and the uh, fetus's death is not bad. Why don't you like his way? 
Well, so one reason uh, has Perhaps to do with... you can say what it is first. Yeah, so, so yeah, good. So, so that's not easy to do, but I'll, I'll do my right. best. So, so, that's so, why I made you do it. Yes, right. So McMahon, uh, McMahon's view uh, is called the time relative interests account of, of the badness of death. And uh, McMahon's thought is uh, to figure out how bad someone's death is, one thing that's relevant is how much they're deprived of, right? How much good stuff they're deprived of. But the other thing that's relevant is what would have been the psychological connection, the degree of psychological connectedness between the individual at the time that they died and the individual as they would have been had they not died at these later times when they would have been enjoying the good stuff, right? So uh, if, you're, if, if someone dies in the prime of life and they're deprived of lots of good stuff in their, in their, that they would have gotten later in life, um, uh, had they survived, they would have been strongly psychologically connected to themselves as they were at the time that they died, right? Uh, you know, I, I have lots of memories of what it was like to be 20 years old. I have lots of the same desires and beliefs and so on. I'm, I'm, I'm strongly connected um, to myself as a 20-year-old, not as much as I am to myself as a 30-year-old, but, but still pretty strongly, right? So if I had died at 20, all the good stuff that I'm getting now, let's say, uh, 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 would have been, it would have been bad for me dying at age 20 to have been deprived of that because not only would it have been good for me, but at those times I would have been, it would have really been me, right? It would have been uh, somebody, it, I would have been strongly psycho psychologically connected to my past self at that time. Whereas, uh, I can't remember anything from when I was two years old, right? So if I had died at age two, although I would have been deprived of all this good stuff later in life, um, uh, the badness of being deprived of all that is discounted by the fact that my two-year-old self and my 46-year-old self are not psychologically connected at all, really. I mean, there's no overlap. There's no. There's no memories. There's no desires. I. You know. There's no. Uh, there's repressed no, memories. There could be. There could be. There could be. Right. Right. Uh, that's the next interview. Uh, uh, so, so the thought is, this is why, even though the two-year-old is deprived of a lot more. Um, it's less bad for them to die, according to McMahon, and that that goes even more for an embryo, right? An embryo has no uh, psychological connections at all with their the future stuff that they would have gotten, and so they're, they're, the badness of the death of an embryo is very strongly uh, discounted on McMahon's view. Um, so that's ba that's that's the view, um, and I talk about some reasons not to like it in in the book. One reason that I don't go into in the book but that's relevant to the discussion we were just having is I think it gets the wrong results in certain cases and especially if we're thinking about two-year-olds. So I think that the death of a two-year-old is really bad and if there's some public health uh, initiative that could prevent the deaths of two-year-olds that that would be really important, right? That we should devote a lot of resources to saving the lives of two-year-olds. Uh, uh, but on McMahon's view, the deaths of two-year-olds, it seems to me, get discounted way too much because of the fact that you know the two-year-old has no uh, anticipation of what it's going to be like to be 46. The 46-year-old has no memory of what it's like to be two. There's hardly any connection between the two-year-old individual and the 46-year-old, and so um, so on, I think McMahon's view too strongly discounts the badness of death. For a two-year-old, um, there's other problems I think that are more complicated and that involve us in a lot of uh, back and forth between uh, between uh, McMahon and his objectors uh, about what actually the view is. But that's one reason that I. But this is one reason that I that I've been interested in this other sort of what a, what a, what uh, Joe Millen calls this a gradualist view about the badness of death. That death is not very bad for an embryo. But then it gets worse and worse as the individual gets older, right? And uh, rather than, on the, uh, as on the deprivation account, death is very bad at the very first moment of existence and then gets slowly less and less bad, right? On the gradualist view, death gets slowly worse and worse as the individual develops, right? Um, and so the view that I was sketching earlier is 
it's supposed to be a competitor to McMahon's view, if you like this gradualist idea that, um, that death gets slowly worse as you develop. Yeah, another thought about deprivation accounts, um, and yours in particular, is that uh, the badness of death seems to be relative to um, the time, uh, the, the technological sophistication of the time you live. So, right. for example, we have longer uh, lifespans now, and let's suppose they fix aging to such an extent that we can continue to exist for hundreds of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like in the Lord of the Rings when an elf dies, right? right. 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 Uh, they're losing, up, they're losing a, a, a whole lot more than a hobbit uh, yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the death of someone, assuming we survive the current presidency and things get better, uh, and technology continues to advance, um, the death of some future person is going to be, they're going to be harmed a lot more by an early death than we would. Yeah, yeah. right. That, yeah, I think that's true. Um, and I think, when I think about the, and that's exactly the sort of thing that I think about in those scenes in The Lord of the Rings when, when elves die, it seems worse <laughs> to me. Maybe it's just because I'm corrupted by by my views, but I think, wow, it's so much more tragic when an elf dies. I mean, that elf has so much, more. and that's why the, uh, uh, yeah, when, when the elves are making more of a sacrifice when they, when they do that. Now, uh, I do feel that, but at the same time, there are certain ways in which it, uh, uh, so there's, there, are, there are implications that are, that I'm less happy to live with. And so, for example, you know, it turns out that the deaths of rich people are going to be worse for them than the deaths of poor people. Poor people don't live as long, right? Now, uh, oh, get, get as much good stuff in the life that they live. Yeah, right, right, that too, right. Um, so they're deprived of more both in terms of length and in terms of what the quality is. Uh, uh, so, so what do you say you about say that? I mean, this is, this is, I, I think that this is just another uh, facet of the injustice is the way that I prefer to think about it is that uh, it's a luxury to have, uh, to, to be someone for whom death is so much worse than continuing to live. Uh, you're lucky your death is so bad for you. Yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so we've already, so the, the views about when, uh, the responses to the timing puzzle have nice names. You're a subsequentist <laughs> um, and not a priorist, priorist huh. or a concurrentist or an eternalist. Right. Now we've heard a little about why you're not a priorist because that, they tend to be desire satisfaction people. Right. And you think that, uh, it shouldn't be, my death now shouldn't be a harm to the people who had the desire, you know, the version of me that had the desires, you know, my death now shouldn't be a harm to me age 20 because that's when I set my sights on living till 2020 or something. Exactly. Um, what about, what's wrong with concurrentism or eternalism? Yeah, good. So, let's we'll start with eternalism. So, so, uh, so eternalism is uh, Fred Feldman's view. Um, I can't remember if, if he gave it that name or not, but the, but the, the thought, it, it betwi really the thought behind eternalism is just to reject the question. So, so uh, Epicurus says, asks the question, at what time are you worse off than you would have been for having died? And the eternalist, the way I'm understanding him, says, there doesn't need to be any such time. It's like asking the time at which two is larger than one. Yeah, so that's right. That's the way uh, Feldman wants you to think about that question. It's just uh, to the, reject the question, right? There isn't a there isn't a time at which death is bad for you anymore. That, except in this eternal sense, in which there's a, there's times that a shorter life is eternally better, uh, worse than a longer life in the in the way that any larger number is larger than a smaller number. Right. It's, etern it's eternally true that this long good life is better than this short good life. Right. That's the that's the eternalist view, and I guess I think that um, that just it, it, it's answering it's, the wrong question. It's answering the wrong question. Right. So you can so the the question 
Yeah, so, 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 so my thought is, let's take the question seriously. It does seem to be a legitimate question to ask, at what time am I worse off for, for this having happened? And if, in, in other cases, if we can say, I'm not worse off at this time, and I'm not worse off at that time. So if, we had, if, somebody, if I'm a smoker, and somebody says, smoking is bad for you, and I say, when's it, when's it going to be bad for me? And, and it turns out that I'm never going to get cancer or any of these things. Uh, you know, then you can point to every moment in my life at which uh, it might have been bad for me and say it's not bad for me then. I think I'd be justified in saying that it actually turned out not to be bad for me to, to, to smoke, right? Um, and I think that the worry is that uh, that's a perfectly legitimate response. Uh, it, it seems, uh, if you can say the same thing about death as that smoker can say, then uh, it seems plausible to say that death isn't bad, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, my my um, objection to eternalism, uh, I think, gets gets to why what is right about Epicurus, and that is, here's how I think we should understand Epicurus, and that says, telling us why we shouldn't care about death. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually still applies in your case, because I could say, uh, it certainly it applies in, to the eternalist, because if it's always bad for me, then I should never care. It makes no more sense to care as it gets closer, uh, you know, as I'm about to die, I shouldn't start say, oh shit, because, you know, it was, it was bad when I was a kid, and, and you know, it was miles away. So yeah. I should never care about it. Mm -hmm. um, but that also seems true on your version of the deprivation account. Because if it's bad after I die, hey, that's nothing to me. Uh, right, yeah, so, so the thought is, grant, grant that death is bad for you, there's a, uh, you know, um, uh, when, when should you feel bad about? Right, when about, should I care, when should I feel bad that de about death? And Epicurus says never, and it seems like, even on your view, that's true. Yeah, well, it might be true. So, so it depends. So, I think we have to keep these questions separate. What, uh, you know, it, uh, is death bad, and how should we feel about it? Right um, now, I think that it may be that for prudential reasons, we shouldn't feel bad about death, right? Because make feeling bad is bad, right? Uh, uh, especially if you're, if you're a hedonist, right? Um, you know, feeling bad about things is is never going to be. Uh, uh, good for you, uh, but but the question is, the interesting question is whether it's appropriate. Like, uh, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate to feel bad about the fact that you're going to be deprived of this future good stuff. I think it can be appropriate to feel bad about being deprived of that future good stuff, and obviously you have to feel bad about it before it, at the times you're being deprived of it, right? But it's, I think it's perfectly appropriate to feel bad about things in anticipation of their happening, right? Um, that we feel bad in anticipation of other things, other, other bad things happen, intrinsically bad things happening, for example, right? If you're, if you know you're going to the dentist tomorrow, you might be feeling bad in anticipation, and given that it's going to hurt, right, that there's some justification for you feeling that way, right? But well, we never feel bad about extrinsic deprivations, okay. do we? Well, I think we do. So, so you might think, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, your parents tell you you can't go to the party tomorrow. Right? Yes, but you, what you're thinking about is the knowing. You're thinking, I, I'm going to be there, sitting at home, knowing that they're having fun, and I'm going to feel <laughs> shitty. It's not that I'm going to be, you know, totally oblivious, and they're going to be having fun. You know, it's not yeah. like I'm going to be sitting there watching a, an okay movie, you know, and, and not having the awesome time I would be. We don't really dread that. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think, so it's, I mean, I'm glad that you said dread, because it might be that the way in which you should feel bad is not dread, but something else. So, like, I think Kai Draper argues for this, that, that you shouldn't dread death, but you should, it's, it's appropriate to be disappointed or, or sad that you're going to die, right? You can be sad, but you're not going to dread it because it's not, dread is not a, an appropriate attitude to have towards a mere deprivation of a good thing, right? Um, I think there may be something to that. Maybe we shouldn't dread death. Maybe it should be just disappointment or something like that. Ah, oh, oh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to be right. dead. Right, right. <laughs>
And maybe it could be severe disappointment, but severe disappointment and dread are still different attitudes, I think. Um, okay, uh, I mean, obviously there's all kinds of... Uh... Oh, oh, one last thing, uh, what about concurrentism? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so one of my students defends concurrentism. Aaron Wolf has a paper. He thinks concurrentism is true. Um, so, uh, what to say about concurrentism? I mean, one, one thought is, my thought about concurrentism always is that it's not going to quite get right the, uh, um, the magnitude of the badness of death. So, well, what, what should we say about it? I haven't thought about concurrentism in a while. I mean, one thought is... It just we, seems like it, 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 the, the time at which death is bad vanishes to infinity. It's like, yeah. it's, it, it's at the moment of death. And what is that? I mean, it's not the dying, right? You right. don't experience it as you're do dying, do dying, dying slowly. That's right. not when you experience the badness of death. It's at the moment that life ends or, or, or what, just before? And it's right. like it seems too small and too fleeting to take seriously. Yeah, maybe that. I mean, there's a lot of badness to cram into that moment, <laughs> right? Uh, I mean, one thought is we... we, we so part of it is wanting to treat different bad, different bad things the same, right? So, mm -hmm. we, in other cases, we don't endorse concurrentism. So we don't endorse concurrentism. Like we go back to the baseball ticket case. Um, you know, we don't say that at the moment that the the tickets were grabbed out of the out of the mailbox. Uh, that at that moment things were things were really bad for, for my friend, right? That, that just seems like the wrong time. I mean, the, the, the time that things are bad, if there's any time, it's the, the later time when the, they would have been at the game, right? So this, I don't know if this is an argument, it's just kind of thinking about, you know, isn't, isn't subsequentism the right thing to say in these other cases, right? Uh, and if it's, but I think what we're doing is, is what I think Epicurus is saying is, okay, if that's the harm, I don't care. Uh -huh. Right. If that's when the harm is, pff, yeah. Right. I didn't notice it. it didn't yeah. bother me. It didn't me. I wasn't. It's not so. Uh, um, I mean, it might depend on the details of the concurrentist view. But if you thought, if somebody really had the view that your well-being level went way down at that time, right? That's going to seem very implausible, given that you were totally oblivious to it. Right. Massive swings in your well-being that you're unaware of. See, are, are fishy to me, uh, to, to people that, that think that experience is an important part of what we Yeah, and, and actually that, that is the other problem I have with deprivation accounts is they seem to tell us, man, you're a lot worse off than you could possibly imagine because once we start caring about possible me's uh, enjoying things that, I'm, that actual me doesn't, well, possible me's are having a wild time on this, some <laughs> fairly nearby possible world where I'm just the happiest guy in the world, you know, and exactly. I'm I'm deprived of that. So I'm uh, there's a big old harm that I didn't even know I was having, and and that just seems to me like whiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. But I mean, of course, you also have to say there's all these nearby yous that are having a horrible time. And so, uh, you know, there's going to be, a, you can probably put them in a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, uh, uh, so, so it's, it's, well, but well, you could say that about death because, uh, you know, don't worry about your death because in this other life, they keep you alive and torture you. Right, right, right. So this is where it's important to, that, um, uh, this is where, the counterfactuals turn out to be important, right? So, um, so if there's no fact of the matter about what would have happened, or even what would have been likely to have happened had you not died when you did, if there's just all these things that might have happened, and we can't say anything about their likelihood or anything, um, then I think the deprivation account falls apart, right? Um, there's no that every death is going to be equally good or bad as any other, right? So it's important that um, there be some facts of the matter about either what would have happened had you not died or what would have been the likelihood of various things happening had you not died on a more complicated view, right? Uh, uh, and given, given those facts, um, the existence of various alternative views that are really having a great time or a horrible time 
are going to be irrelevant, uh, except insofar as they would have would have been you, or would have been likely to have been you, had your death not occurred. I mean, but uh, if if you think about it, um, you can get a far away me actually be me if it's far away because of a divergence very early in my life. So, for example, um, something if something had happened in utero, then I would have become the emperor of the world. It's still connected to me because, so then I can say, boy, it I was really harmed by that in utero thing because, because that happened in utero, I was sent down this path that leads me, you know, to this life instead of being the path that would have led to me being, you know, emperor of the world or whatever. Right, right. I think that's the right thing to say. I mean, that just strikes me as right. right? So, so, so something, the worst yeah. things it, that happen to you happen to you at the very earliest moments, even well, if you don't die. I mean, if give, given given the story that you just told, that's true. Now, because I, because that that's going to lead to the the widest possible divergence. Because yeah, once but a I, few facts are settled about me, then you know, once you know, I was out in the world. There, there was very little chance of me becoming emperor of the world. Or yeah, you know. well, well, I think I, I think the the earlier on you go and talk about what would happen if there this little change was made to this embryo, um, the less plausible it's going to be uh, to assert any counterfactual about what would have happened had that change been made or not been made, right? So uh, is it true or not that if this little change had been made to the embryo that this individual would become emperor of the world? Well, uh, I mean, I've seen plausible sounding arguments from, from Alan Hayjack that uh, uh, that all, the, all counterfactuals are false, but, but even... Uh, uh, these seem especially likely to be false. Like it, it, maybe, so, so the best you could say is if this had happened, then maybe you would have become the emperor. What's the likelihood that you would have become the emperor? Very small, right? Mm -hmm. Given how many other things would have had to have happened in the meantime for that to happen, right? Uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, those in utero events uh, uh, see, seem unlikely to have a big, it, it seems, it, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to point to some in utero event and say, that was really good for you or that was really bad for you. The best we're going to be able to say is, it might have been, it, there's a chance that that in, in utero event was really bad for you, um, but, but I don't think we can say anything more than that. And so I, I think maybe that takes some of the sting, that would take some of the sting out of the, out of the thought. Um. Can we say that, or can we say, we just don't know? You could say that too, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a possibility. It, 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 we just don't know where, how much we're harmed by it. Yeah, there could, be, there could be, if there are facts about what would have happened to me now, if some tiny event had, changed, had been different uh, to the embryo that became me, right? Um, then, yeah, it seems right to me to say, I could be much worse off, I could be much better off, and maybe I was greatly harmed, and maybe I was greatly benefited by something that happened in utero. Um, well, doesn't it then sound more sensible to be Epicurean? Because it's like, if you start worrying about that, you'll never get anywhere. You'll oh, yeah, consume yeah, yeah. your life. Yeah, no, I think you shouldn't worry about that, probably, right? <laughs> um, but the question, but but there's another question whether that's just for practical reasons, right? So okay. for practical reasons, there's nothing you can do about what happened to you in utero, so better not to worry about that, even though maybe it would be appropriate. So just stipulating that if this thing had happened, you would have been emperor of the world, you know, it would be appropriate, right, be fitting, to, to really regret that thing not happening, still for prudential reasons, better to forget about it. Probably true. Um, okay, uh, there's obviously we could talk about death for forever because um, death is great. Uh, but uh, I want to ask you uh, to say a bit about uh, hedonism and why you think it wins out over desire fulfillment, perfectionism, and pluralism. Just, you know, Super fast. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think it's in, intuitively everybody 
uh, uh, can see the plausibility in thinking that pleasure is good for you and pain is bad for you, and we all act as though this is true. Um, so the question is whether uh, whether this is a base level fact, this is a fundamental fact about well-being, or are these things good because uh, because of some other reason? Like is pleasure good because you want it, or is pain bad because you don't want it, for example? Um, so that's one issue, and the other issue is whether these are the only things. So should we say that pleasure and pain are the only good and bad things, or should we also say that knowledge is good and virtue is good and and, uh, and other sorts of things are good? And justice and rights, which you, you just seem to be talking about a little. <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, yeah, but they're not good for you. I don't think it's good for you to have rights. So, so I think it's important. So when we're talking about theories of well-being, we're only talking about what's good for you. And you might think that there are things that are good, like justice, uh, but think that justice isn't intrinsically good for individuals, right? It's just good. It's good for the world when there's justice, but it's not good uh, inherently good for any of the individuals. Uh, but uh, 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 so that's why when you look at when people have objective lists of uh, objective list theories of what's uh, of well-being. Um, justice is not usually on the list. It's knowledge, virtue, uh, achievement, uh, uh, those sorts of things get on there. The things that are happening to the individual, right? Um, so, uh, so I have a couple arguments. There are kind of technical arguments in the in the book, and one of them has to do with the paradox. Uh, 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 the paradox is a, fun, a paradox of desire fulfillment, but it actually applies to many views. Um, and the paradox is, suppose you have somebody who desires that their life go badly, and just stipulate that that's their only desire. Um, we run into a paradox, because suppose the desire is satisfied, right, then, on, then that means that uh, the object of the desire is true, namely that their life went badly. Right? right, but it also and means their that, life goes well. But their life goes well on the view because their desire was satisfied, right? Um, so if it goes well, then it doesn't go well, and if it doesn't go well, then it does go well. So you, this is a paradox. Uh, and uh, there are things that you can say to try to get around this paradox if you're a desire fulfillment theorist. But the the view the, the paradox is going to arise on on other kinds of views, true too. So if you think that true belief is is good for you, then you might think you know, suppose you truly believe that your life is going badly, then you have a true and that's your only belief, right? Then. Uh, uh, if your life if your is life going is badly, badly, then it's not going badly, badly and so on, right? right. So, so um, um, and since true belief is, is, is essential, essential to knowledge, knowledge then that's going to, the, the view that knowledge, knowledge is uh, a, a, a constituent of well-being is going to be affected by this paradox, paradox too, too, right? right. Uh, uh, pleasure, pleasure, hedonism doesn't have this paradox, so I, I think that's a nice thing about hedonism. You don't have to try to solve this paradox. I mean, of course, there is a famous paradox associated with hedonism, but it's a different right. kind of paradox. Perhaps mention that. Right. Yeah. So the paradox of hedonism uh, is the view that it was well, uh, the paradox is uh, pursuing pleasure doesn't seem to be the best way of getting pleasure. I think that's what people usually pre refer to as a paradox of hedonism. So, so the best way to be happy is to think about things other than happiness. Right. Uh, pursue knowledge and friendship and so on. That's the best way to be happy. But if you think about being happy, then you're not going to be happy. Right. It's it's a different kind of paradox. It's kind of a practical paradox. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I don't really find it that troubling, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, you know, like, yeah, that's if you're a hedonist. That's when you say, start great. talking about self-effacing theories. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't think it's a problem for a theory to be self-effacing in that way. But, uh, uh, what a, uh, so we've done, and you mentioned pluralism as mm -hmm. well, really, because it, it, it uh, comes in the list theory. Now, um, the other uh, supposedly knocked down criticism of hedonism is uh, the experience machine, of course. Right. Uh, Robert Nozick is famous for this example. Right. So perhaps give that one. Yeah, so Especially the experience in this age of red pills and pills. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so the experience, the argument, uh, it's actually, uh, I think the best way of stating the argument from the experience machine is to say, you know, if you had two lives, 
that were exactly a, had contained exactly the same experiences. Right? But in one life, the person was actually doing various things. They were actually playing the piano and going on hikes and various things like that, and have having friendships. And in the other uh, life, the person had experiences of doing all these things, but they were actually hooked up to a machine that was making them have those experiences. Right? Um, that the the life uh, where the person was actually doing those things would be better for the individual than the life on the experience machine, right? So, not necessarily that the life in the experience machine would be a terrible life, but it just wouldn't be as good as the life where the person is actually doing these things. Uh, um, and I think a lot of people find that plausible, and then you, you might try to motivate that by saying, well, would you plug into the experience machine if you knew that these were the options? And most people will say, no, they wouldn't want to plug into the machine. They'd rather, they'd rather do these things. But, you know, I've, done, I've surveyed my classes, and usually, you know, some percentage of the class says, no, put me in the machine. I'm ready to be hooked up. <laughs> uh, Probably so it's an not... increasing percentage as time goes on. Yeah, that's right, right, right. Uh, uh, so, uh, but that's but this is important because the hedonist has to deny that whether the experiences they're having are related in any way, how the experiences they're having are related to the world, are irrelevant to their value. All that matters to them is their intrinsic character. Are they enjoyable? Right. And so uh, the hedonist has to say all that other stuff doesn't matter. And the experience machine argument is supposed to show that you probably think it does matter, right? Because you probably think this life is better than the life on the, on the machine, even if they're identical in their experiences. Um, and I do think that this is a, a problem for hedonism. And my way of addressing it is to, is to say that once you start looking at, once you start thinking that stuff outside of you is affecting how your life goes, uh, you run into these problems. And one of the problems is the paradox thing that I just mentioned, uh, that all these views that try to say that st how stuff is going outside of your experiences makes a difference are going to run into this, this paradox. But the other one has to do with timing. So the, hedon so the, the, the question is, you know, at what times are things going well for you? Right? And if you're a hedonist, you say the times when things are going well for you are the times when you're having these, these pleasant experiences, right? And the times that things are going bad for you are the times that you're having the painful experiences. That's it, right? Simple story, right? Um, if you're a desire fulfillment theorist, for example, what are you going to say, right? So if you think that stuff outside of your experience affects how well your life goes by, say, being true, right? Um, so you want something to be true. Uh, and it's true or it's not true, right? That's outside of your experience. Um, uh, well, when are things going well for you? Is it the time that you have a desire? Is it the time that this thing outside of you is happening? Right? Both those answers seem wrong, and they seem to get wrong results. So um, you know, if I now want to do something in 10 years, you know, then presumably, unbeknownst to me, right now, things are going well or badly for me. That can't be right. Um, or if I want something to be the case in 10 years, right? Well, suppose I die in the meantime, right? Then if we say that the time at which things are going well or badly for me is the time at which the thing that I want to happen happens, and I'm dead, then I've got to say that my well-being level is going up and down even though I'm dead. Well, and also there's the problem about uh and of course, this comes up in Parfit, Parfitian discussions of personal identity. You know, what if my desires change? Mm -hmm. So suppose I, I desired to uh, meet the queen when I was young and impressionable, and then I became an ardent anti-monarchist, and then I met the queen and I hated it. Well, in some sense, little me is getting the best, is having the best day ever at the right. time that I'm hating it. Um, yeah. You know, which desires count? And, right. and right. It, am I even the same person? But that's a different issue. Yeah, no, that is an issue. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there are things you can, you might say that, well, um, so, so one way to think about it is on the desire fulfillment view, you look at all the desires that you have throughout your life and you see to what extent were they satisfied or frustrated. Um, and you just kind of add up all the satisfactions and frustrations. And so in that case, 
little U, there'd be some desires that are satisfied, and then big U has some desires that are frustrated, and so they all kind of wash out. Uh, but you should just have, uh, I mean, the obvious thing, advice is desire to wake up in the morning, desire to have a small sip of water, right? And don't desire anything yeah. else. Right, right. Right. Because then you, you're always satisfied and you're never frustrated. Right. And that yeah. just, just seems... Just, yeah, just yeah. desire that the mathematical truths be true and right. desire it very strongly all the time. Right. Then right. you'd be doing really well. I mean, I think if you're a desire fulfillment theorist, you got to bite that bullet. you got to say, if you could get yourself to have those desires, then things would be going really great for you. <laughs> um, yeah, now I had one more question before I let you go. Um... Yeah, what would you say are the, the claims of yours that other philosophers give you the incredulous stare over most? You know, <laughs> uh, the famous uh, David Lewis uh, yeah. incredulous stare. I mean, it's probably not hedonism anymore because there's a few other hedonists out there. I'd, I'd say it's the most, the degree of incredulity is probably the highest with the zero well-being for dead people claim. Uh, so some people will say, oh yeah, that, that, that seems right, yeah, that's good. And the other people will just look at you like, what are you, you cannot be serious. You're the <laughs> Those, uh, uh, that's probably the biggest incredulous stare that I get. Yeah. So. Um, it's good to have that because otherwise you're not standing for something. That's you're right. That's right. Obvious stuff. People will remember you if you say that that wacky right. thing. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta find the golden mean though because that's you don't right. want to, don't right. want to go too far. That's right. Um, okay, here's a question I ask everybody: uh, What do you think is the value of philosophy in the contemporary world? Yeah, good question. So. Um, uh, I think there's value. So, so what I've noticed in the last few years is that there's uh, 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 there are scenarios where people are relying on philosophical views without necessarily either being aware that they're doing so or without being aware that there are alternatives. And one of the areas is uh, it relates to death, and that is uh, in public health. So in, in the public health arena, and in people who are worried about uh, the global burden of disease, uh, uh, trying to figure out which diseases are most important to treat and where to allocate resources and so on. Um, all these questions that we've been talking about, about whether death is bad, worse or better as you get older, uh, are being pre answers to these things are being presupposed in that literature because they're trying to figure out you know how bad are these various deaths and the, we, we should try to prevent the ones that are worst right um, and so this is an area where it's really important for uh, philosophers to to talk to these people and, and to try to see what the, what the options are and what what you're committed to if you say this or that, right? And actually, uh, and so there's there's a book coming out that I have a paper in, and lots of other people you've heard of have papers in called. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's gone through different titles, so it's called something like "Saving People from the Harm of Death," uh, and where where uh, philosophers and social scientists are are addressing these kinds of issues. Um, so that's one, just an example of a kind of uh, case where uh, it's important, uh, what philosophers are doing is important for, for things that are being done and has potential, has important implications. Yeah, my first undergraduate professor had an aphorism that I think is a good one. I don't know where he got it from. It's, uh, well, it has, like all aphorisms, it's good and it's bad, but it, he said, philosophy is not about answering questions, it's about questioning answers. Uh -huh. And I do think that that's a, an important philosophical skill, is to at least recognize your uh, embedded assumptions. Right. right. Uh, okay. And it does seem that too often people think that certain things are just the way of the world, like capitalism is just true you know that's that that's facts and then you have these other theories right. that are clearly just theories whereas when we can just go back to the truth or 
and libertarianism seems alarmingly popular, at least some kind of bastard version of it that would make Nozick, uh, you know, turn yeah. in his grave. He, he is, because he could still be alive, so he's still <laughs> suffering. Yeah. He's still being harmed. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah. and it's, and also you see online people saying, well, you know, feminists, I, I use logic to just dispel these feminists. And it's right. like, I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I think in all these areas, it's important. And uh, 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 it's, yeah, no, as, as important as ever, I guess. Uh, so you're not a Vic Constinian who, who tries to uh, dissuade his most, his most brilliant pupils from... Uh, you know, tries to persuade them to become car mechanics and things like that. No, I mean, I think it's great to be if, if people want to become car mechanics, but that doesn't doesn't preclude you from also having some philosophical training. I mean, I think it's it's important for everybody to have some degree of philosophical training to be able to uh, get along in the world. <laughs> and it, it's so it's philosophy not a, and the art of motorcycle maintenance. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for agreeing to do this, Ben. It was very pleasurable, and I wish, uh, I mean, one of the, the tragedies of this is that you could carry on forever, but people are only going to watch the first 10 minutes. So. Right, right, that's fine. <laughs> that's if anybody's still here. Yeah, if you're well, still I'm here, made it through. it's the good stuff. <laughs> All, right. All right. Yeah, so uh, maybe do it again sometime. Absolutely, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye.